Good morning, ABC Church. My name is Justin. My wife, Erin, and our three kids have been part of the ABC Church family for the last four years. In 2012, we were called to the Central Coast to lead LifeWater International, and ABC has been involved with various LifeWater initiatives over the past few years. I want to tell you about an exciting new initiative that we're starting together right now. In southern Ethiopia, which is pretty far away, there uh, is a people group called the Aroma, Aromia people. And they exist, they're heavily Muslim population, and we have been doing water projects among them for almost 10 years. In the recent years, we've tried to expand our projects to do more than just meet the physical needs, but to also integrate the spiritual transformation that we want to see happen in our project areas. Just a couple years ago, we formed a partnership with a church planting ministry called City Team. And what they do is actually place Ethiopian nationals in our proje pro project regions to work arm in arm with Life Water field staff to meet persons of peace and actually start churches among Muslim people. It's a very exciting new pioneering initiative and I'm grateful that ABC has gotten behind this in a significant way. Thank you. One of the things that we will see in the next few years is we will actually see churches planted among Muslim people by Muslim people as they start to reach their neighborhoods with the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's a very exciting, very transformative behavior when nationals can do it among nationals. And you have to remember, these are places where Western people like me or like evangelists that have traditionally come from Western nations just simply aren't welcome. It's a very new paradigm that's happening in the missions world, and we're very uh, fortunate to be able to do it together. So thanks for investing in missions. Thanks for investing in unreached people. Thanks for caring about people that are hurting and are broken and are in the far corners of our world that we may never actually meet face to face. It really does matter and your contributions make a huge difference in the world today. Yeah, it is exciting. We have opportunity, uh, not only there in Southern Ethiopia, but also in Indonesia with our partnerships there, working with nationals, uh, outreach. Uh, we're going to be talking about other opportunities in the days ahead, Southern uh, Sudan and uh, Northern uh, Uganda, where there's a huge refugee crisis going on, uh, and other places in the world where the gospel has yet to go as we talk about these things uh, as a congregation and very strategic in our outreach. Hey, if you, uh, if you have your Bibles, turn to 1 John chapter 5 in our If God series. Um, and verse 14 of chapter 5, 1 John chapter 5 says, This is the confidence we have before him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. So our question this morning is, does God really hear us? If God hears me, if God, does God hear you? And how can you be sure if God hears you or not? And that's what we really want to zero in on. And so can you be sure that God hears you? And if so, how can you be sure that God hears you? We begin, first of all, by asking you a question. Are you saved? Because it all begins with the relationship. And here's what you need to know about God. God is under no obligation to listen to you to hear you, to respond to you, if in fact you do not have a relationship with him. I, I hear people all the time, particularly in difficult situations, you know, maybe in their own life encounter or with someone else, and they realize I'm a pastor, and I'll hear them say things like this, hey, could you send a little prayer up for me? Oftentimes when people say that, there's an, a kind of an indication that maybe they don't have a real close relationship with God, and sometimes they'll say, hey, I said a little prayer for them, you know, kind of in passing, those kinds of things. And, uh, and it's intriguing to me because, you know, it's kind of like writing a really great letter, but if you don't address it properly, it just doesn't get there, you know? I mean, how many times have we paid bills? Do you remember the days when bills would actually come in the mail, not simply to your email, and that you'd actually kind of fill out you know the bill itself and then you'd write a check and you would put it in the envelope and then you know or envelope however you say it, put a stamp on it boom mail it off you know and uh and how many times have you thought you mailed it you know only to receive back a second notice that you've not paid the bill and you go back and you look at your checkbook and say no no i paid that and you go to quicken or whatever your method of of accounting is and you go back and you go no no i wrote it on this particular date 
And then months later, you're rummaging through your car and you find it there. Oh, I guess I didn't actually get it in the mail. See, it's kind of important, isn't it? The address, the correct address, and getting it in the mail. Um, John said in the previous verse, verse 13, these things I've written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. I've written you this letter, he says, because I want you to know for sure that you have eternal life. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Salvation, friends, is a event that takes place in time through faith in Christ, but it carries out throughout our life. In fact, these language that the Bible, this particular letter was written in, happened to be the Greek. And in the Greek, it's written in the present tense, which means that salvation is something that takes place at a point in time, but the implications of it continue on. Kind of like if you were to draw an arrow in a line that goes to that back to that point. And it makes all the difference. Salvation. And the way in which we live our lives matters. So many people think of heaven as a destination, almost like it's a vacation. You know, for, for example, maybe let's say that this summer you, you want to go to Hawaii. And so you're trying to make arrangements for your Hawaiian vacation. And you start searching the internet for not only housing deals there, but also good plane ticket prices. And all of a sudden, you find this killer deal. And you say, man, the prices of these tickets are amazing. Let's buy the tickets. We'll figure it out. We're going to Hawaii this summer. Yes! You bought your ticket. You're going to Hawaii this summer. Wouldn't that be exciting? So many people treat salvation that way, that we have our ticket, right, and that someday we're going on vacation. But what the truth of the matter is, is that eternal life starts now when you accept Jesus, and it changes everything about your life from this point forward. Eternity starts now. And the place that you see that best is at the end of this physical life that we know. I've had opportunity, and some of you too, to be at many of those kind of experiences when you're there at the end of a life. And I got to tell you, it's like night and day for people who have a present hope, ongoing relationship with Jesus. It's unbelievable. About two months ago, during this particular service, sitting right here, my phone goes off in my pocket. Unfortunately, I had it set on vibrate. And I get a little bit annoyed at that because most people know me and they know that I actually, you know, at 11 o'clock, you know, that's kind of the time when, when most pastors are speaking. And so I, I get out of the service, you know, and I, before I walk out to the connections booth, I look down and it's my friend Larry Modrock. And I haven't heard from Larry in a long time. And I think, what's he calling me during a service for, you know? And so when I get in the car to go home, I hit the, hit the voice message that he left. And he said, hey, Tom, Jim Little, our friend, is in the hospital. He doesn't have long to live. I think you need to get here. And so the next day, I got in my car and drove to, to Santa Clara to see my friend of 40-plus years, Jim Little, who had been on dialysis for a number of years, had struggled with diabetes for years, and um, his heart was down to about 10% 10, 10 capacity at this point in the hospital. And as I was there and, and uh, all, I said, you know, Jim, Gail couldn't come with me today. I said, could you record a little message for Gail? Just, uh, and uh, I never intended to show this to anybody but Gail. And I showed it, I've shown it to my family because it was pretty amazing. But I thought today about you. And I thought, you know, some of you have never had an experience, even though this is hard to see, um, You've never had an experience where somebody comes to the end of their life with this kind of hope and what it means, all the difference in the world. So I want to play for you a little video from my, my buddy Jim, who is with Jesus right now. But uh, I am totally at peace with God and with my Lord Jesus Christ. And um, I, I'm thinking of, of a man named R.C. Sproul that is one of my favorite nice. Bible teachers you uh, alongside Tom Farrell <laughs> that uh, 
is an older man now and sick, and he recently shared that I'm going to live forever. I'm just going to have a change of address soon. So I'm looking forward, Gail, to seeing you and Tom together, Larry, uh, someday, and we'll spend some good time together. But I'm just resting, resting in God in, in, in every way. And even though I'm a sinner, a, a, a big sinner in some ways, I'm saved only by the grace of Jesus. And two days later, the Lord graciously took him into his presence, um, and he didn't suffer any, anymore. That confidence, and for him to say those words, I'm just changing my address, is that kind of confidence that he wants for us all to have, that we know that we, we even though we may end this life, like Jim or some other way, we have that confidence that we're saved, that where we're going to go when we die. So when I looked at this, I thought, you know what, what's some evidence of salvation? In other words, how do we know if a person really is saved, ourselves included? And so I decided to say, what does the Apostle John in his writings from his gospel and from this letter say about assurance of salvation? And for you and your small groups, this will be a good opportunity to drill down a little bit on this. Here's some evidences from the Apostle John. Number one, you listen to God. My sheep hear my voice, John 10, 27. Secondly, you follow God. John 10, 27 also says, and they follow me. Third, we've spent quite a bit of time in this series talking about obeying God from 1 John 2, verse 3, 1 John 4, 6. And 1 John 5, 3 says this, for this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. The fourth one is this, that we no longer love the world. 1 John 2, 15, do not love the world nor the things of the world. And that would happen to be one of the key passages of Scripture that when I came to Christ between my sophomore and junior year was really convicting to me because I, I loved everything about my life and the world and everything else about it up until that point. Number five, my experience was this, that the world doesn't understand us and the world does not know us. When I came back as a junior from the summer, having gone to Hume Lake, making a commitment to Christ, all of a sudden, my friends didn't know what to make of me because I wasn't going to the parties anymore with them. Things had changed for me, and uh, they didn't know what to make of it. You know, what's happened to Tom? Of course, it was the 70s, so all they could do is label Tom, he became a Jesus freak, and that was, that was all they understood uh, about me at that moment, at least. And then number six, that we have a love for others. And we know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brother in 1 John 3, 14. And you know what was really fascinating for me is that I felt a little bit like I was living my life in black and white up to that point. And when I met Christ and came back that summer back to my high school campus, it's as if everything became color. I started noticing people that I'd never even noticed before because my focus was exclusively on my group of friends and the things that I was involved in, and, you know, good-looking girls, whatever it was. I, I would focus on those things. But what God did for me is he gave me this amazing love for other people, so much so that it even directed me to where I am today as, as a result of that. And, and one of the true signs of salvation in a person's life is all of a sudden you'll start caring for others and caring about the welfare of others, and which will bring us to our third point today that we look at. So God is under no obligation to hear from you unless you know him. And the truth of the matter is, is that you can have a relationship with God through his son, Jesus Christ. It begins at a point in time, but it carries on throughout your whole life. It's salvation. Salvation are you saved? Secondly, do you pray? So had God not only wants us to have confidence in the fact that we can know for sure that when we die we're going to be with God in heaven forever, salvation, but he also wants us to know that we can have confidence to talk to him, more confidence in prayer. Do you pray? And I don't mean do you just pray when times are tough. Um, you know, here's the thing. For a lot of people, they think, well, you know, I'm busy 
And most of the people I know are busy. In fact, when you say, hey, how's it going? How's things? Oh, busy, you know? So, yeah, they're busy, you're busy, I'm busy, we're busy. We're busy, all right? Everybody says they're busy. And if we're busy, God's got to be busier, right? So we think God's got a lot going, and so God's busy. So I don't want to bug him with the little stuff. So most of us, a lot of us, will kind of make a deal with God. And the deal goes something like this. Hey, God, uh, I know you're busy, so I'm not going to bug you with the little stuff. I got the little stuff, all right? So I'll just handle the little stuff, but there are some times when I could really use your help. So I'm just going to come to you with the big stuff, and when I come to you with the big stuff, I'd very much appreciate if you'd help me out. So we don't talk to God much. The big stuff comes. We talk to God, and God doesn't seem to respond, at least the way we think he should, and then we get mad at God. That is so often the way it works. And yet, friends, I believe that God just like any meaningful relationship, desires to hear from us more often than simply when we're in a jam. Um, I, I'll tell you the truth. In a moment of transparency right now, I can tell you that in the years of my marriage with Gail, the greatest challenges that we've had have been in the area of communication. And it's not her communication, it's mine, or lack thereof. Okay? Women, you can hit your husbands right now. It's fine, all right? So... Uh, we tend to struggle with that just a little bit more and and you know i'll do anything like you know like service kind of thing for my wife but what she wants more than me doing things is for me to kind of open up uh, on the inside just a little bit more than i i typically do and we've got this little buzzword you know like like tom's gone hermit you know, so kind of pulling in, you know, and so that's kind of our buzzword of, you know, why don't you start talking a little bit, buddy. So the fact of the matter is, is that just as in a marriage, uh, you know, intimacy comes from not just doing, but, but communicating at a deeper level, so it is with God. You know, for those of you who are parents here, particularly if you have grown kids, one of the tough things for us as parents is that when our kids get into a jam and they get into a tough situation, and all and, and you're kind of in retrospect looking back on it and you ask that question so when you were encountering this why didn't you talk to me about it and i'll tell you what's a dagger in the heart is when they say well i didn't feel like i could and it's like what do you mean you didn't well and then they'll describe why they didn't feel like they could that just breaks our heart as a parent doesn't it how about god our heavenly father do you think it breaks his heart when we don't go to him on a regular basis? God desires for us to talk to him. There are some conditions that he lays down, though, in terms of our own prayer life. Number one is a clear conscience. 1 John 3, we saw a number of weeks ago now, verse 21, Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. In other words, we do have confidence if we have a clear conscience our heart does not condemn us and then it goes on in verse 22 and whatever we ask we receive from him because we keep his commandments we're obedient and do the things that are pleasing to him having a clear conscience when god speaks to us and we're sensitive to it and we listen to it and we respond to it john started out in verse in chapter one talking about this idea of confessing our sin before god it's not a question of do we sin after we're Christians. We all sin after we're Christians. The question is do we repent from it? Do we repent? Do we get right with him? Do we have a clear conscience? Psalm 66, 18. One thing is very clear in the Bible. If I regard wickedness in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. So clear conscience is key. Second thing is praying according to God's will. And this is the confidence that we have before him. If we ask anything according to to his will he hears us when jesus prayed he said lord thy will be done robert law has said this a tremendous quote here prayer is not an instrument of getting man's will done in heaven so in other words it's not trying to talk god into something but getting god's will done here on earth that's what prayer is about so here's the thing when you spend more time in conversation with god about all things you begin to get in tune with God to the degree that you actually desire to do what God wants done instead of trying to convince God to do what you want done. On those rare occasions that you call out to God, when you're ongoing talking to God, you begin to move into His direction. And here's the thing about it is, is that, that God really is 
trying to do some things in and through us in this world and that it's far better that we align with what he's trying to do. That's why even our missions strategy, we know that God says the gospel will be preached to the ends of the earth and then the end will come. We want to, as a church, strategically partner with God in reaching the ends of the earth, the 2.5 billion people that have yet to have an opportunity to say yes or no to Jesus. And the way to do that is through partnerships because those are the places that the gospel has yet to go. God's reaching the world. We want to join him in what he's doing. Those are the kinds of things that we begin to do when we're on an ongoing basis. Do you pray? Do you talk to God? And, and it will demonstrate itself in the way in which you live your life. And then the final question is this. Do you care? Do you care? Uh, verse 16 is a really tricky verse. There are some passages in the Bible, some verses in the Bible that are harder than others. This happens to be one of them, so let me be really honest about that. If anyone sees his brother committing a sin not leading to death, now we're talking about a sin, obviously, leading to death. He says, if anyone sees a brother committing a sin not leading to death, he shall ask, and God will, for him, give life to those who commit a sin not leading to death. And he follows it up and says, there is a sin leading to death. I do not say that he should make requests for this. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin not leading to death. There are sins not leading to death, and there is a sin leading to death. So the million-dollar question is, what is the sin leading to death? It sounds like it's pretty important. Can we agree with that? It would be very helpful if we knew what it was so that we don't commit it, correct? So then the question becomes, what exactly is it? Unfortunately, the readers who originally got this letter must have known because there's no explanation that John gives. He doesn't follow it up and tell us exactly what it is, okay, what exactly is the sin. So it's left for scholars, which is a fancy name for smart people, to figure it out for us, right? And unfortunately, they don't all agree. Now, you will find there are places in the Bible that are like that, that you come to a place, you don't understand it, you go read people who are smarter than you, only to find out, to your dismay, there is two or three different opinions on this. And sometimes, the more you dig, the more opinions you get. So let me give you the three most popular opinions, all right? Here we go. Opinion number one, what is the sin unto death? It's the unpardonable sin. The unpardonable sin is referred to in Matthew chapter 12, verse 22, and Mark chapter 3, verse 29. It apparently is a sin that took place when Jesus was on earth performing miracles, and the religious leaders said of Jesus, he's doing this by the power of the devil, not by the power of God, to which the reference came, this is blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, referred to as the unpardonable sin. Second, and by far the, well, I should say, the second and most popular opinion is apostasy. Apostasy simply means this, and that is that there's a renunciation of the faith and a denial of Christ. If a person renounces the faith and denies that Jesus Christ, in fact, is the Messiah and the Savior of the world and all of that, that that is the sin unto death. The third view is, is physical death. This happens to be what I would call a minority position. And, uh, and other, so what this means is that the person dies physically, but it doesn't mean necessarily that they're disqualified from going to heaven. And we have a number of examples in that in the scripture. In fact, in the church at Corinth, when they were taking communion, uh, Paul gives them a stern warning about abusing. They were kind of partying during the communion service. People were getting drunk and they were eating like, you know, like gluttons and those kinds of things. And he says, look, man, this is a serious time when you take communion. You need to do some self-reflection. You need to judge yourself. You know, you need to use this time for some self-evaluation. And he goes, I tell you the truth, you know, some sleep because they've not been doing business with God. Now, when you sleep in the Bible, that means you die. Now, does it, does, it, does it mean that those people were disqualified from heaven? I don't think so, okay? Uh, I mean, some would argue uh, Ananias and Sapphira when they lied, you know, and all that, and they, they ended up dying at that moment in the book of Acts. For some of you who know your Bibles a little bit better, the question is, are they in heaven or not? I, I'm kind of expecting to see them there. But God actually took them home in that sense. Um, uh, Old Testament, remember Moses? Moses was leading the children to where? the promised land you think he was excited about after 40 years getting those complaining people over the river to the promised land i think so 
And yet he had a moment in which he got very angry and God says when he struck the rock, he says at that point, you know what? You've disqualified yourself from leading them into the promised land so that when he got to the Jordan and he wanted to go over, he pleaded with God, you know, Lord, let me, let me, let me take these people over to the promised land. And the Lord said no. Uh, and and you, in fact, you can read it in Deuteronomy chapter 3. And basically he said, appoint um, um, Joshua to, to lead them into the promised land. Uh, you're not going to. Now, my question for you is, do you think Moses is in heaven today? Pretty good chance. If he's not there, we're all in serious trouble. Okay, so... <laughs> but he was disqualified from taking them to the promised land. Um, that, my friends, is my best guess, that in fact it may be physical death, that there is unrepentant sin from some who he's saying, you know what, even if you pray for them, they're not going to repent. And, and very possibly, as a result of that, God's going to take them home. Uh, if they're truly his, take them home. Kind of like a timeout, you know, for, for kids. You know, okay, timeout, you know, and only timeout is going to be with Jesus in heaven um, at that point, but disqualified. That's my best guess. I think bottom line is, is that there are some things in the Bible that we have to live with that have some degree of tension, in other words, we don't fully resolve or fully understand everything. But the things that are most important in the Bible, and that is how to have a relationship with God through His Son, is just unmistakable, all right? There's no question about how a person goes to heaven and can have that assurance. It's through faith in Christ and Christ alone. There are so many things that I know, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that I have a hard time doing, that I'm okay living with a few things that I don't fully understand. Are you okay? <laughs> with that in other words the bottom line on this isn't necessarily that we know exactly what the sin leading to death is in that sense or the sin but it's really what what's the whole bottom line or point here the point is this we ought to be concerned with other people and helping other people who are stuck in sin and taken advantage of by satan therefore we need to be concerned about helping others overcome sin and satan it begins with ourselves. But it begins with, the, but it goes, extends itself to others. Do you care about helping other people? See, if you know Jesus and you're talking to God all the time, the next thing is, what about other people? Are you engaged in helping other people overcome sin? And here's the thing, is that we as Christians, we're family, and if we truly love one another, we'll help each other. We are called to hold each other accountable. And yet it requires for us risking relationships. And so many times we say, well, it's not really my business. I'm afraid that, you know, if I say something, they're going to be mad at me. Or, or all these other kind of things that come straight from the world. Very clearly, the Bible says, if you're concerned about your brother or sister, do something about it. The Bible makes it clear. We have a responsibility to others to help them overcome sin, not give up on them, and to overcome Satan and the issues that are, resol that are involved in that as well. Here's what he says in verse 18, another challenging verse. We know that no one who is born of God sins. Stop there. Think about this. No one born of God sins. Question, do you sin? You don't have to shake your head. But we all sin. That's why 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, plural, he's faithful just to forgive us our sins, plural, it seems that it's an ongoing condition. What does this mean? This is a, one of those examples written in the present tense. In other words, the person who is born of God does not habitually practice sin. We don't keep sinning. That's the bottom line. And so as a person who has a new nature, we recognize that we must repent from our ongoing sin. But he who is born of God, God keeps him, and the evil one does not touch him. We know that we are of God, and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. No one born of God makes a practice of sin, and that's what we're talking about. Jeff Erke talked about this several weeks ago. The second thing is not only helping others and ourselves and others overcome sin and Satan, but the other thing is to know Jesus better. All right, that the end game for us, look what verse 20 says, that we might know the Son of God has come and given us understanding, here it is, so that we may know him who is true. We may know him who is true. And we are in him who is true. In his son, Jesus Christ. 
This is the true God and eternal life. What is? The Son, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is God. And in Him is eternal life. Friends, we want to help each other get to know God better. Not only to overcome sin, but get to know God better through His Son, Jesus Christ. That's what we're all about. Do you care about other people getting to know God better? Are you helping other people on the journey that we're all on to help others get to know Him better? It starts with your own family, your own children. It continues to those relationships that you have. And the third one is this. We need to fight idolatry. We all need to fight against idolatry because the reality is is that we live in a culture where we, friends, are defined by, in fact, our name is consumer. And as a consumer, that seems like that's all we do, is consume, consume. That's even our identity. Who are you? You're a consumer. We can take that mentality of being a consumer into every avenue of life. When you come to relationship with God, you are no longer, believe it or not, a consumer. God actually changes your identity to actually be a contributor. That you're now not simply here to consume, but you're here to contribute. God is doing something in the world. He invites you to participate along with him as a contributor. And so he flips everything upside down. The thing about following Jesus is what you need to know is that he takes conventional wisdom and he just flips it. See, in the world, if you want to be great, you need to be at the top of the pyramid. You need to get as many people as possible underneath you. That's what it means to be a leader. But Jesus says, no, I tell you the truth, that in fact, if you want to be great in God's kingdom, we're going to flip this pyramid upside down. You're to become a servant of all, of others. Idolatry. Putting anything before God. See, as a consumer, the world says, get a good job, make as much money as you can, spend your money to make you and your family happy, comfortable, those kinds of things. If you can, save some for the future for a rainy day. And if you have anything left, you know, throw a few bucks in the plate when it goes by on a Sunday morning. That's what consumers do. They consume everything for themselves. God says just the opposite as a contributor. He says, no, you give to me first, not from the last, but from the first. You save second so that you have a little bit to be able to help others with because literally it's not simply about you. It's being able to help others as well. And third, you live on the rest. Everything that God does, he flips upside down in our lives seemingly so that we are no longer slaves to idolatry in the hands of the evil one, Satan himself, but that we, come, we become genuine contributors and not simply consumers. And so, the questions today, does God hear you? Are you saved? Do you pray? And are you concerned about helping others? Because when you are, God really does pay attention and listen. Father, I thank you for your word and the power of it and pray, Father, that you might really move into our lives so that we would not only draw into a relationship with you through salvation. And some here today, Lord, need to respond in faith and belief that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, that you loved us so much that you gave your only begotten Son that whosoever believeth that him should not perish but have eternal life and that we can be assured of that salvation just like my friend Jim. But Father, beyond that, Lord, you want to hear from us. You're not simply looking for us to talk to you when we get in a jam. We can't help ourselves. You want to hear from us continually. And Lord, there's some things that we need to do in terms of keeping a clear conscience and those things, God, that, that would draw us into a, a more meaningful relationship with you so that we would do your will. And then, Lord, that, they, that we would have a genuine concern for others. Help to set the captives free. Lord, help to engage people to get to know you better. And, Lord, collectively together, we all need to, get, we need to fight against idolatry. Lord, even as we give of our offering today, I pray that it might be a reflection from a change in priorities. Or we're not first, but you are. That this relationship that we talk about with you is meaningful and real and genuine.
And God, that you would be well pleased with our lives. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. You were the word at the beginning. One with God, the Lord most high. You hid in glory in creation. Now revealed in you are Christ. What a beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus.
What a powerful name it is. Nothing can stand against. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus. You know, the amazing thing is, is what a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. And, and to think that the God of the universe longs to have a, a relationship with you. Some of you, you don't get that yet. You know, you don't feel like you're worthy. You don't want to bother God. You're not sure he's interested in your life. The God of the universe has demonstrated his own love towards you, and he desperately wants to have an intimate relationship with you. The only thing holding you back is you. It's not him. It's you. Engage fully in your relationship with Christ. Become a passionate follower of him, and you will find meaning and fulfillment and assurance in your life that can only come from him. Amen? Amen. Thanks for being here. God bless you. See you later.